Welcome everyone to another episode of the Research Works podcast. We hope you've had a great week so far and we're so glad you've decided to join us today. So glad you've decided to join us and welcome back again, Marissa. I love having you on the show. Thanks for having me. Always, always happy to have you. We're very excited about this paper we're going to be discussing today. And I know we say that each week we talk to such brilliant people every single week, but this one is hot off the press. It's about an area that we often don't get to see many publications in, so I'm super excited about this. Joining us on the show today is a lead author of a pretty incredible team known to many of our listeners, I'm sure. So welcome, Monica Tui from the Cerebral Palsy Alliance Research Institute in Sydney, Australia. <laughs> Hello, how are you going? <laughs> Very good. Thanks for joining us today. No worries. Thanks for having me. We're very excited. So thank you so much for joining us. We know that you're, like Dana said, representing a big team and as is what is needed for a systematic review. So I'm going to just give you all a bit of an update on what we're talking about today and also on your amazing background and achievements, Monica. Mm. So today we'll be talking about your article titled Effectiveness of Postural Interventions in Cerebral Palsy, an Umbrella Review, published in Paediatrics and Child Health in 2024. For our listeners, Monica Tui is a research therapist at the Cerebral Palsy Alliance Research Institute and affiliated with the University of Sydney, where she focuses on improving interventions for individuals with cerebral palsy. With a background in physiotherapy, Monica is deeply involved in the systematic review and evaluation of postural management techniques to improve the quality of life for children with cerebral palsy. Her research covers a wide range of therapeutic approaches, from adaptive seating to orthopaedic interventions aimed at preventing deformities and enhancing mobility for those with significant physical impairments. Amazing. Really, really amazing. Great interests and things that I definitely align with. It's amazing. I'm very excited too, especially that physio in me gets, yes, this is our (laughs) fundamentals. Yeah, that's right. Bread and butter. (laughs) But before we do, as usual, we're going to jump into an icebreaker, so something completely different. And this is prompted by the um, Royal Show and school holidays and other activities. Yes. Monica, what is your favourite theme park ride and why? Oh yeah, so um, <laughs> I love this question because um, I am, I don't have children myself and I um, am a big kid and so I really <laughs> love doing things like this. Um, and a couple of years ago when I first moved to Sydney actually, I got a season pass for Wet n Wild in Sydney <laughs> and so Wet n Wild is um, definitely my favourite theme park. I love and that. I reckon my favourite ride, there was one that um, you have four people in a big like floaty thing and you kind of go in and there's a bit, yes. it feels like you're going through a, um, it feels like you're in a washing machine. Yeah, um, yeah. So, <laughs> that's my favourite, I reckon. That is a cool ride. I think I've been to one similar in like um, Universal Studios or something like that. There's so much fun because you do get really wet and yeah, it's cool. But Yeah, and there's like dark bits and yeah. um, fast bits <laughs> yeah, and then yeah. a few minutes to like a few bits to catch your breath and regroup. And yeah. the lack of control when you shoot out the end of the water slide especially if there's other people in there like the weight distribution things move around it's yeah it's good fun I find all that yeah, very scary. Yeah. I love that you like you got so excited about that one. I love that. That's really yeah, cool. Yeah, I can see it in your face. That's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm so like on the other side of when it comes to theme park rides. Um, I and like I, I'm not really good at spinning things. I just get I get quite dizzy. I get motion sick. So like theme park rides don't tend to do very well with me. And after going on a roller coaster ride when I was a little kid, I was like, I'm never going on one again. Um, until one day I went on one without realising it was a roller coaster ride. <laughs> That's the worst. So it was terrible. And I don't know why I didn't gauge it. So we're lining up for this ride. They're like, empty your pockets, put your bags into the locker. I'm like, okay. So I go, I'm an adult, you know, like should be able to discern this. You line up, going along the path. It looks really exciting. And then you sit down. It was like moments before it went off. I was like, oh, my gosh, I think this is a roller coaster ride. Sat down. The thing comes on front to lock you in. And I'm like, there's no escaping this now. I'm going on a roller coaster ride. So the whole time I'm just like holding on for dear life. You know how they have the photos and they take photos of you in yeah. random places. And my face the entire time was of just sheer horror. <laughs> and every time I did the little climb, I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> You're one of those people with your eyes oh, deeply I, yes. shut. I was <laughs> petrified. I was like, I cannot believe I accidentally went on a roller coaster ride. So Look, it wasn't one my favourite thing to do, but I feel happy that I did it and I conquered something that as a child I was very fearful of, but never again is yeah, my I'm thing. I'm surprised you've done that. That's amazing. I know. It wasn't yeah. that long ago either. Mm. So, yeah. 
Look, I yours. love <laughs> the swings, those ones where you go oh, up and down and around gosh. and you're in a swing and it almost feels like you're flying. You can put oh. your arms out and, oh. yeah, that's my yeah. favourite. It's because <laughs> this momentary thought of flying and I don't get yeah. to get too dizzy on that one. So yeah. that's These my favourite. These are the ones that actually go out. The faster they go, they sort of go, yeah, like, yeah, they've got the long chain. Yeah, yeah. And then you go out to the side and go up and down and... Yeah, awesome. Yeah. See, I can see the excitement. I know, I can have fun with you. Yeah. 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 The funny thing is actually I get really motion sick as well, really seasick, but I love boats. I love rides. Like I just kind of (laughs) (laughs) prepare by taking a tablet. (laughs) Go with it. (laughs) I love how you've just taken a completely different approach. I need to try to adapt that. I look at it from fear and go, no, 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 (laughs) no. I don't think I could. (laughs) Hmm. I feel like that um, icebreaker question is a great informal way of getting to know someone. Yeah. That was brilliant. Got to know us really well. If you come to Perth, we'll have a great day out <laughs> at one of the theme yeah. parks. Yeah. <laughs> I'll come along and I'll watch. I'll have my popcorn and I'll watch. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> All right. Well, oh, you can relate this to what we're talking about. Because when you do rides, you have to like have some postural control and yeah. lock yourself in. Normally we yeah. can't find the way it links, but this is great. So let's tell all of our listeners a little bit about what we'll be talking about today. So this paper investigates the effectiveness of postural management interventions for individuals with cerebral palsy. The study evaluates a range of interventions aimed at improving movement, managing tone, supporting posture and preventing musculoskeletal deformities. By synthesising data from over 200 randomised controlled trials and other studies, the review provides valuable insights into which interventions show the most promise, while also highlighting the need for further research due to the overall low quality of evidence in many areas. The findings offer practical recommendations for clinicians and caregivers working to improve the quality of life for children with cerebral palsy. Incredible. Ooh, Very so exciting. Excited. But let's start, <laughs> Monica, with talking about postural control. Can you tell us a little bit about how it's defined and what, what it means? Mm. Yeah. So postural control, I think a lot of people um, would just think of this as balance. And so it's being able to maintain your body's um, centre of mass over your base of support or um, maintaining the ability to align and adjust your body segments against gravity Uh um, without falling or collapsing. Um, And it involves, there's a few different, like there's a lot of different processes involved in postural (laughs) control, Um, but there's kind of anticipatory postural control, which is um, you kind of recognise that something's going to happen. And so Mm -hmm. you make an adjustment in your body so that that can happen. So an example is like even reaching. Um, So what we don't, we're not even aware of this, but if I was going to reach over and get my um, a cup of tea to have a drink, um, my body would make some postural adjustments to anticipate that that's going to happen. Um, and then the other one is reactive. And so that's where, you know, like you're at the shops and someone bumps you and you might need to kind of take a couple of steps to catch your balance or, you know, you might need to, you kind of do a bit of a, a lean and then come back again. Yeah. yeah. And so that's how to react when your postural control is challenged. Um, when you didn't know that that was coming. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's really good. I like that. Great description. Now, Beautiful. can you tell us a bit about yeah. how it's established? Yeah. Yeah. So um, it's established really from really early. So there's been some studies in babies where they looked at um, they put electrodes on their postural muscles, and from one month of old, like one month of age, when a baby was sitting, um, they kind of held in sitting, and something happened to change their position. They could see that these postural muscles were starting to fire um, to wow. um, control the baby's position, and so that's a baby that can't even sit yet. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and so it's starting from really really early, and um, the way it kind of develops in humans is that we um, get development over our head first. So babies sort of, you know, develop head control first and then it sort of works down and you develop the ability to sit yeah. and then to sit and do things mm-hmm. and then to um, start to be up on your legs, um, starting to pull up to stand, starting to stand, starting to walk yeah. and then getting more challenging from there. But, yeah, yeah, humans are pretty slow compared to a lot of animals that, you know, pop oh. out of the womb and start, start walking. walking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. Yeah. Okay, I didn't think of that. I yeah. do find humans that fascinating. Really <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So it really is a process that just adapts and grows as the human gets bigger and uh, yes. and yeah. so mentally starts yeah. working differently, really, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And one of the tricky things that happens too is that um, when we're babies, we've obviously got quite small bodies. You know, I often say to parents, that's why they're making small because you fall over it. It's not so far. <laughs> <laughs> um, and as our bodies get bigger, yeah. um, we have to adjust to 
our changing bodies, you know, yeah. and that's why teenagers often look a little bit gangly and uncoordinated because their bodies <laughs> are growing so rapidly that they're sort of like trying to work out, you know, yes. how do I move my body now? Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's funny that you said that. Actually, I caught up with someone yesterday and they were saying how their sons just suddenly grown and really tall. And my first thing was, oh, that really gangly, awkward, poorly coordinated face. And he's like, yes, yeah. he is. <laughs> yeah. But you can see it. Yes, yeah. your body has to cope yeah. with that. And it doesn't seem like they're just yeah. quite yeah. one yet. Yes, mm. yeah, yeah. So obviously the most rapid development is mm. kind of over the first 12 to 24 months, but sure. it's really developing, you yeah. know, and we're having to adjust throughout our lives. And yeah. then, you know, at the other end as aging processes start and we have to start adjusting to, you know, how we're working yeah. with um, with our ageing bodies as well. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Amazing. And you can mm. see how it's so important, obviously, to mm. us in our everyday life. Yeah. In everything, yes. even yeah. you're talking about from anticipatory when we don't do things we don't even think about, mm. you know, reaching for things yeah. and yeah. Um, getting us around yeah. safely. and Yeah, yeah. And so, so, like, Dana on the roller coaster was probably anticipating and just, like, <laughs> clenching. <laughs> clenching. <laughs> <laughs> I know, my <laughs> neck muscles, yeah. Yeah. everything was just yeah. sore. <laughs> it should have been. Yeah. I just didn't go with the flow. <laughs> yeah. And now, obviously, it allows us to, yeah, to move, to be safe on our feet. Mm. But now bringing back to children with cerebral palsy, yeah. what do we see in this population with regards to postural control? Yeah. Yeah. So um, we really see that it's, um, yeah, it's definitely affected. Um because when you look at a picture of a brain, so cerebral palsy is defined as a um, a disorder of movement and posture. So, and we often forget that posture bit. Yes. And posture is really important for movement. Yes. Um, and um, you know, by some kind of injury, usually to you know injury or maldevelopment to the brain, or some issue with the, some dif- difference with the way the brain works and controls movement. Mm. Um, and so the. Um, and the process is involved in postural control. Like obviously this is an audio, mainly an audio medium, and so I can't show you a picture. But when you look at, you know, from a neuroanatomy textbook, when you look at a picture of the brain and they show you all the parts of the brain that are affected, you know, that are impacted, yeah. that are involved in postural control and, you know, um, it's heaps. And yeah. so when you've got something that um, affects the brain, um, that's, yeah, that's going to affect how you can how those processes work yeah. and the, you know, the pathways that the processes and the messages that need to be traveling up and down and to, through between different parts of the brain. Mm. Um, and some of the parts of the brain that are really involved, are the cerebral cortex, the basal ganglia, the mm. thalamus, um, the cerebellum. And so if you've read any MRI reports from children with cerebral palsy or from people with cerebral palsy, a lot of those are some of the key yeah. words that are often coming up as yeah. parts of the brain that are affected. Yeah. 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 And can you describe to us then? Um, are you yeah. good? <laughs> Oh, I was going to say, and um, we know that it's more effect. Like um, post- the postural control is more affected as motor impairment increases yes, as well. And yes. the GMFCS is basically a description of um, you know postural control at different is, um, different at levels of you know postural control impairment. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. So children at, um, with GMFCS level one have not very much postural control impairment compared to children at GM or you know people at GMFCS level five. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, it's such an important point to make about the GMFCS levels. It's directly related because that's how it was really formed. And mm-hmm. you think about all the anti-gravity movements that are mm-hmm. needed. But I love how yeah. you brought up the different parts of the brain that are affected because you can't just say you're working on one thing in one area. It's such a complex network. Mm-hmm. It's vision that drives a lot of it as well. It's your position yes. in space. Yes. It's um, yeah. feedback, sensory information and feedback. It is yes. a complex process, isn't it? It's not, yes. it's not one yeah. dimensional And anyway. everything <laughs> happening really fast as yes. well. So, yeah. 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 For it yeah. to be effective in real time. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We could talk about this for ages. I know, because then we'd like that. Yeah. But across the GMFCS levels, like you talked about, the large differences in postural control, therefore our interventions, which yes. is what we're going to jump into, mm. is, um, is yeah. so varied. So true. Yeah, that's a really good insight. One of the things that I did see in your systematic review was the reference to the really well-known Goff article in 2009. Now, we did mm. manage to speak with Martin at the um, the last conference in, at EACD. And when you speak oh, with great. him and you see him present in person, you realise what a deep thinker he is. Like that was just one of the best things was to see how he thinks about things. And so the last time you sort of reviewed this, and this was referred to in your article quite a few times in 2009, so that was probably the last time a review like this was done. Can you, do you remember what some of the recommendations or what some of the conclusions were based on that article? And I guess what was your motivation then from embark, from that to embarking on this systematic review? 
Yeah, yeah. So um, some of the key findings in that paper were um, they talked about passive stretching and included sleep systems in that, mm-hmm. um, and they found that there was no evidence for that passive stretching or use of orthoses affected the development of deformity. So mm-hmm. orth- orthoses might have other indications, but for prevention of deformity, yes. um, they didn't do anything to change that. Wow. Um they also talked about um, issues with studies, like around stretching, they talked about issues with some studies where um, they only included people who were able to um, adhere to a program for a kind of a certain amount. Like, mm. so anyone that didn't do it for a certain amount, like who didn't kind of meet the dosage that they were needing for that intervention, right. um, weren't included. And so that's mm. obviously an issue because the people most likely to <laughs> not be able to manage those programs are the people <laughs> yeah. who are most likely to have those impairments. Yeah. Yes. And so that's kind of, um, yeah, so that's a real issue. Um, mm. And one of the things that they pointed out that um, often there's uh, there were unintended consequences as well. So yes. pain is a big one that came up with stretching programs as well. Yeah. And um, so they needed to be, um, they really recommended that they needed to be more measurement of pain. Yes. Um, with um, any postural interventions, postural mm-hmm. management interventions. Yeah. Um, they also talked about assistive devices. So with seating and standing frames, there was um, little evidence for specific seating systems mm-hmm. um, preventing deformity um, and that they weren't as effective in practice um, mm. in improving posture as well, mm-hmm. um, which, yeah, I think it's, but also it's really hard to study some of these things because that was they talked about specific seating systems where um, I think if, you know, in practice we know that you can't just say this seating system is going to be right for all these people. That's you right. know, there's a lot yeah. of things that come in. Yeah, yeah. so um, that's one of the issues um, is that there's a lot of heterogeneity in our population but also yes. in our interventions. Yes. Um, yeah. Yes. Um, and, yeah, so a lot of talk about the personal factors, so pain being a really big one yeah. um, and the impact of communication on pain as well, mm. uh, like com- being able to communicate in pain, mm-hmm. communicate pain. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that, that um, potentially is underreported because, again, the people most likely to be having issues with pain and having mm. some of these interventions are the least able to self-report that. Yeah. Um, yeah, and... They also talked a lot about um, uh, needing to move away from this focus on body structure and function Mm -hmm. towards activity and participation. Um, And I've actually, do you mind if I read out a quote that I've written down from this paper? Yeah, Yeah. yeah, sure. Um, So this is verbatim. Um, Goff said, a reduction in the allocation of resources to physical postural management programs aimed at preventing deformity may make these resources available for other management options. And they were meaning things like communication, participation and transition to adulthood. So this is 15 years ago. Wow. um, Yeah. Yeah. Wow, wow. <laughs> um, yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. So um yeah, so I guess we're really interested in mm. knowing well, what has happened What's since happened? then because yeah. they made like Goff made some really great recommendations and suggestions actually. Um yeah, and I guess the motivation for this paper was um it was invited as part of a um an issue of a journal that's called Pediatrics and Child Health. Yes. Um and that journal is um aimed at paediatricians and paediatric trainees in the UK um, and they kind of have article uh, issues on certain topics and so this was part of an issue that was on cerebral palsy and so there's other papers in that issue um, covering like AFOs in CP, upper limb function in CP, management of hypertonia in CP um, and yeah and this was a paper in that article in that issue about postural management in CP and kind of love just giving an overview of the state of the evidence. It's in so this area. great, yeah. especially in light of what Goss yeah. said. Like he said, 15 years ago, yeah. great recommendations. Yeah. Let's see what people did. Hey, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I know that you and your team. It was an umbrella systematic review. Mm. What is mm. what is this? Yeah, it's very. We yeah, don't yeah, I haven't heard of this umbrellas. Term no, no. No, so you might not have um, heard that term before, but um, I imagine that a lot of people listening will have read an Umbrella Systematic Review or at least know of one. Mm. Um, So the traffic light paper that Iona Novak Mm -hmm. led is um, an Umbrella Systematic Review. And so what what an Umbrella Systematic Review is, um, it's like a review of reviews. So it's um, where you collect and assess the kind of quality and the findings of multiple systematic reviews and meta-analyses on a topic. Yeah. yeah. So it's kind of pulling together because it's sort of, and this methodology is sort of developed because um, thankfully over the years, like there's heaps more systematic reviews that are being published, but um, it's sort of hard to navigate um, because systematic reviews have a very specific scope. And, um, and so it's sort of hard to, 
navigate, you know, there's all these different systematic reviews and how do we pull them together yeah. Yeah, to sort of put some of those findings together. So but that's the aim I of mean, a systematic, an umbrella review. I guess, yeah. you know, when you think about an umbrella, it really is something that's meant to be something that covers as much of it as it can. It's the mother of systematic reviews yeah. kind of thing. <laughs> so yes. it's comprehensive yeah. is what we're yeah. trying to say as well, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. Very cool. I and, like it. And can you go into detail for us yeah. of this massive, <laughs> comprehensive systematic <laughs> review? What was included? What were your terms and what were you focusing on? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so we did an initial search that was just sort of posture and CP, and that was how we kind of came up with some of these, with like our initial list of interventions that we might sort of look at individually. Mm. Um, and then we and we kept it, we tried to keep it quite broad. So um, we, like our um, population was CP, so like thinking of that PICO, um, you yep. know, expression framework, yeah, mm-hmm. so our population was CP. Um, the interventions, so initially we just sort of searched for any intervention um, and then we came up with this list and we all kind of, you know, went off in our little writing pairs to um, <laughs> do a search for some of the interventions that we'd found mm-hmm. and um, then our comparison was any comparison, so we mm-hmm. didn't mind, we didn't, we weren't, you know, we didn't mind what was the comparison, like what was the other interventions that people were doing sure. um, in comparison to that, yeah. um, and uh, the outcome was any outcome as well. So we're interested in any outcome from this intervention, but kind of with this, you know, we had this real lens of postural um, kind of postural control yeah. or um, maintenance of posture by prevention of deformity or, right. um, yeah, things like that. Yeah, and um, we just initially we just included um, systematic reviews. Mm-hmm. Um, that was our preference was to mm-hmm. just include systematic reviews, but there were some interventions that no systematic review had been done and so then we might kind of drop down to the sort of lower levels of evidence yeah. um, for interventions that were like these are really commonly used and we still want to include them in the paper because there's no even though there's no systematic reviews being done on them, um, we want to present the evidence that is there because we know some of these are so commonly used. Yeah, that's brilliant. That's a, And I love that you have done that because often those are the ones that we wanna, we're want we curious about because there's nothing published on them. Yeah. So we'll talk more about that yeah. in a bit, but yes. So when you're yeah. doing yeah. systematic reviews and you're obviously looking at studies that are including postural control and postural management, can you describe a bit more about how postural control is measured and assessed? Yeah, so really <laughs> varied. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so it's really interesting, actually. I was looking um, at, you know, what are assessments of postural control? And there are a lot of assessments of postural control um, that measure kind of aspects of postural control specifically. So there's things like the SATCO, which is the segmental yes. assessment of trunk control, um, the pediatric reach test, um, the timed up and go test is considered the measurement of postural control, um, yeah. the kids best test or the best test. Um, the like there's, yeah, there's a lot early clinical assessment of balance. Um, so yeah. there's a lot of kind of assessments of postural control. Yeah. Um, it was really actually interesting looking then at this list of assessments and then looking at all the outcomes measurements that we <laughs> used in these papers. And I don't think any of those were used um, <laughs> in measuring postural control. Yeah, right. in the um, papers that we, um, in the primary outcomes that we kind of mm. found. Yeah. Um, so a lot of the outcomes that we used in the papers that were included in our systematic review were um, like the GMFM, mm-hmm. so either the whole gross, like the gross motor function measure, so yes. either the GMFM 66 um, or subtests of that, sometimes, uh-huh. you know, just using the subtest in isolation um, to look at the different um, kind of aspects of gross motor function yeah. um, or um, gait parameters or measures of upper limb function mm-hmm. um, or range of motion or, um, yeah, range of motion was used, um, like trunk, okay. you know, um, spinal, like cob and things like that. So sure. the ones that are more looking at deformity, yeah, yeah so their postural management rather yeah. than postural control. Yeah. A lot of challenges there, aren't they? I mean, already, like yeah. measuring. <laughs> just yeah. one component of yeah. it. But it is. It's a complex yeah. – postural control is complex mm. and so to measure it, you mm. know, requires – a lot of thought about what kind of assessments reflect the actual activity itself, which is really interesting. Okay. So Mm. let's get into some of the results of, of what you found. I mean, I guess just for everyone to know, definitely want people to look at the article. It's presented beautifully, so easy to read. Mm. Uh, So there were 33 studies that were included, um, which appraised 41 different interventions from 27 primary systematic reviews, four RCTs. Mm. (laughs) 22,000 participants, (laughs) yeah, in all those studies. So it's comprehensive. I mean, this is why this is so important. And the the way you presented it, I love how you did mention about, you know, the traffic light system that Iona had led a few 
years ago. It's presented beautifully with a beautiful diagram as well, which I love a good diagram. So we're going to start to go through yeah. that. Um, so I thought maybe let's start with the ones that are below the worth it line for movement. And when you look at what's below the worth it line, there's the usual things that we've seen in the previous reviews already. So we've got NDT or Bow Bath, uh, Voita, which is often there too, and, and suit therapy. But there's two there that are that we haven't really seen published anywhere before. But like you said in the paper, are commonly used in private practice. So there's both CME and DMI, CME Quevismetic Exercises and DMI Dynamic Movement Intervention. So talk us through a little bit more about what was below that worth it line and why they find themselves there. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so those interventions um, are often what we would call more passive interventions or mm-hmm. like bottom up interventions mm-hmm. in that they're really kind of working at the, um, the you know, the primary kind of impairment mm-hmm. um, rather than the what's the outcome that that's affecting. Yes. Um, and yeah, or what's the function that that's affecting? Um, yes. So a lot of these are really working on um, yeah those primary level impairments. Yes. Um, and uh, they um, so we put them below the line because the findings from a lot of it from either the findings from studies were um, that they weren't effective mm-hmm. um, compared to um, in the example of NDT like wasn't effective compared to no intervention or mm-hmm. um, when compared to um, activity based interventions or body structure and function based inter- approaches um, mm-hmm. was less effective than those interventions yes. yeah so that's yep. why that one's ended up below the line yep. um, and I know you've had a whole episode with um, Anna Tabella who yeah, um, yes, did a recent right. systematic review on meta analysis on yes, that yeah yep. so I again guess that probably makes direct really people consistent. to some of the discussion yeah yeah, yeah. That's well right. I mean and it's consistent because we weren't generating new um, knowledge we were drawing on all the systematic reviews that's that right. already out yes, there so true. that was the systematic review that we yeah, used for um, yep. yeah for this, um, for that intervention. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah. And then some of the others like Voita did have a systematic review. Mm-hmm. Um, but when we looked at that systematic review, um, there was actually no one with CP who was included in that, who was, uh, um, in that systematic review. Right. Um, it was, um, people with other conditions or like ex prem babies who it didn't specify whether they went on to have CP or not. And, mm-hmm. you know, only about five percent of preterm babies mm-hmm. have CP, so mm-hmm. um, yeah, that um, it's probably reasonable to assume that they didn't have CP. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah so Voiter was below the line because we're like, there's actually just not really any evidence in CP, okay. so we don't know. Yeah. Um, we haven't got evidence to say that it works. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, for CP. Yeah. Um, and then thinking of ones like DMI and CME. Mm-hmm. Um, so but those two, there were no systematic reviews, no other published papers that we could find in CP, mm-hmm. and so both of the references for those in interventions um we then looked at the clinical trials register the clinical trials.gov um mm-hmm. register of clinical trials yeah. and so that's what we refer to in both of those so there's um right. the um cme there's a study that um it says on the trial register it's completed um but there hasn't been anything published that i know of that mm-hmm. may you know that may have changed in the last tiny little bit of time but yeah. um yeah, yeah at the time that we drew all this um that we searched for all this evidence hadn't been published yeah. um so again like nothing published to say that we know that it works in CP. Um, And DMI, there's one study that was on that clinical trial register that is currently underway in Mm -hmm. Egypt. Um, But again, no, um, there's nothing that's been published to say that it works in CP. Really interesting. And I just want to read what you, what was written about um, CME just to ask some questions around. So it says CME, uh, the clinical bottom line is that whilst this therapy is widely available in private clinics, despite the lack of evidence, it is scientifically unlikely to work as the individual's role in the movement is passive, not active. I'd love to linger there for a little bit because that's sort of uh, the scientifically unlikely to work. Talk us through what that means. (laughs) Yeah, so I guess we think about the mechanism of action with a lot of these interventions. Mm. So how um, not only does it work or doesn't it work, but like how do we think it works, Um, which is really important to keep in mind um, because the, yeah, so how is this, what's the proposed mechanism of action for that? Mm. And is that feasible that that would work mm. um, in CP? Mm. And so when we compare that mechanism of action to other interventions that have a similar kind of approach or a similar sort of mechanism, um, we don't think that it makes sense mm. that that would 
that that would be effective. Mm, yeah. Mm. Um, and we consider, yeah. And we would consider it to be a more passive intervention, you know, like everyone sort of says, Oh no, you know, the child's working really hard and, mm. you know, um, and like, yes, they're not passive in the sense that it's not like doing passive movements or passive stretches, like when the child's lying, they're not doing anything. Yes. Um, but it's not active in that, like who is deciding to make that movement happen. Mm. Um, it's not the child kind of initiating that movement and doing a movement that they want to do. Mm. It's them kind of responding to a movement that's being, that someone's making their body do. Yes, yeah. Yeah. yes. I love that distinction. Um, and so thinking about, passive, yeah. Yeah, because passive, like you said, often people think it's just like someone's moving them entirely. But we're talking yes. about yeah. passive as in neurologically, who's making the choice, the self-initiation of the movement, which as we know mm -hmm. is our active ingredients for motor learning, for example. Yeah, yeah. And often the way that they're practised is so removed from a real life task that you need to do mm -hmm. um, that then when you, if you're not practising that real life task, then um, we off, we don't see that that task actually gets better. Like they might get better at that very specific way of being handled or being, you know, the, the very specific yes. mm -hmm. um, techniques that are used. Um, but then they may be no better at sitting on their own or, you know, they may be no better at standing and walking. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. Look, as a physio, obviously we're always looking into, you know, different ideas and mm. different trains of thought. So to see what Validity, there is, I guess, evidence mm. behind it. And we know there's no scientific evidence for DMI, but obviously I wanted to look into mm. it just to see, you know, because a lot of the families we know are accessing, accessing it in the community. Mm. And when I was reading through some information on DMI, I was interested when it said that one of the goals of it is to provoke a speci specified active motor response from the child in response by defined dynamic exercises prescribed by the therapist. So that's kind of what you're saying in terms of the passive component is that the movement is initiated or Provoked by the therapist and not the child themselves. Is that mm. right? Mm. Yeah. And so then when you take that to a very different context where the child is sitting there and thinks, oh, I might get up and walk and go and get, you know, a drink from the fridge. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's a very different kettle of fish to what is happening inside some, you know, in um, a therapy session where someone else is dictating your movement yeah. because, you know, getting up and walking over to the fridge, that has a whole extra, you know, level of um, planning, complexity and processes planning. and planning yeah. and, you know, things that need to happen. Yeah. 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 So I think yeah. in that itself is quite interesting because, I mean, that was taken directly from the website because that's where you can find information mm. about DMI. Mm. And it is specified in there uh, that it is in response to a defined dynamic exercises, which significantly contrasts with mm. any scientific information that we do have, which is obviously reflected mm. within this paper. Um, what you do mm. go on to say here, which I found really, uh, I mean, I love the word opportunity cost because that's something that we need to be thinking about all the time, I feel. Like if we're going to be providing an intervention, is it significantly enhancing their outcome so it's worthwhile? Or are mm. we taking away an opportunity? And what was said here about DMI was since other effective approaches exist and there is a lost opportunity cost for the individual. Um, can you flesh that out a little bit more for us? I mean, I've got my understanding of it, but I'd love to hear what you say yeah. about that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's... You know, this brings me back to like year eleven economics, where you're talking about opportunity cost, and you know, like in an economic kind of sense. But um, yeah. and like it, sometimes it is um, and it, like there's lots of you know, lots of economic kind of things that come into it. But also, I mean, there's lots of things that come into it. Mm. Um, but economics is certainly one. So one is like the cost of it. Um, that you know, um, there's a big cost in delivering some of these interventions, yeah. and is that the best way to spend our money. Yeah. Um, you know, in Australia, we've got the National Disability Insurance Scheme and that's always in the media for, mm -hmm. you know, spending too much money. <laughs> and, um, you know, is that where we want to be spending? Is that the best way to be spending our money? Mm. Um, and also opportunity cost um, in terms of, um, like, time for the child as well um, and time for the family. Yeah. Like it really, um, you know, it really breaks my heart sometimes. I think um, a lot of parents and I would say more specifically mothers are often giving up opportunities to go back to work and, you know, like, so the impact on the broader family yes. and things like that um, so that yes. they can take their child to therapies. And so, you know, are you yeah. giving that up for a therapy that's going to be helpful or not? Mm. Um, but also like, is it interfering in other functions? Mm. Um, like are we doing improving one function? So some of the things like the garment um, 
therapies um again have fallen yes. below that yes, worth line. Too, yeah. and you know like is that um is that worth it is the outcome worth it in terms of then the impact on other areas of functioning like um independence with dressing or toileting or things like that yeah. um and so yeah what other areas of function is it giving up and also like if you're spending your time doing a therapy like that what are you not spending your time doing and mm. is that things that might just be a lot more fun you know mm. like mm. staying at home and playing with your siblings or yeah. going to day you know or going to daycare again like yeah. it makes me really sad sometimes when I hear that kids aren't going to daycare and the reason the primary reason for that is so that they can go to therapy and I think oh daycare is so good for kids you so know daycare rich. school like it's yeah, so good for yeah, kids that's yeah right. that's right and um yeah. you know um yeah so like what are you give? yeah what are the things that they're giving up um mm. and also what interventions are they not having mm-hmm. um and like I know I'm a physio I believe really strongly and you know like trying to you know in motor skills and all that sort of stuff yeah. but there's plenty of times that I'm like do you know what this is I don't think this is the thing to spend your dollars and time on I yeah. think you know what's actually going to make a bigger in um, difference for a child's yeah. um, function is mm. communication. Like, spend your time doing speech with, you know, yeah. with a speech pathologist, yeah. or, yeah. Um, or you know, um, independent like self care practice of self care tasks, or you yeah. know, things like that. Being able to access um, assistive technology. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And I, there's so much in there, isn't it? So much. Yeah. Even things like, mm. um, you know, therapies to promote function, and you know, get it on time mobility framework, and yeah. getting kids up in walkers. You know, I don't want kids to miss yeah. out on that because I know I love seeing no. when I go out and see kids just interacting yeah. in their walkers upright. You know, from yeah. one year of age. Absolutely. You don't want kids not yeah. having those opportunities because we're no, trying to work towards right. the developmental milestones mm. and obtaining the yeah. postural control for those before we we do other yeah. things. So it's it's yeah. not only like you said what they um that it has no effect, but it's what they might miss out on in yeah. the time while they're doing yeah. these things. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think um you know I've been to like I've seen many adults with CP speak about this at conferences or just in discussions and you know and they sort of like oh god can we move on from walking being the be all and end all like Mm -hmm. I actually Mm -hmm. didn't care that I couldn't walk and had to use my wheelchair most of the time Mm -hmm. um I don't know you know and I think um it is a really it's a really hard tightrope to walk between um we want to help someone improve their function as much as possible Mm -hmm. but also someone needs to live their life and you know um Everything is, needs to be evaluated. Are we doing that at the yes. cost of yeah, yeah that's right. Other things. Everything yeah. needs to be yeah. evaluated, and we need to be thinking about that opportunity cost all the time of what's mm. relevant for that person. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. we have yeah. this to guide us. And I guess the other part of why things are below the worth it line is not only is it scientifically uh, not likely to work uh, for things that we do know that work by comparison. It's also adverse yeah. events, isn't it? So you did list some yes. adverse events for ones below the worth it line. Uh, and that was in particular with suit therapy, wasn't it? Suit therapy, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's been some um, issues with like um, overheating, um, mm-hmm. like, um, you know, maintaining like bo- like t- body temperature regulation, yeah. um, being quite sick. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm trying to think what some of the other ones are now. Um, even whilst you're but think- also other interventions. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, even whilst you're thinking about that, like overheating is a big deal yeah. because for kids who have uh, seizures, um, being too warm, yes. all that can really set them off too. Mm-hmm. We know that, right? So we do need yeah. to be very thoughtful yeah. about temperature control. <laughs> That's yeah, vital. absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah definitely. Um, and it can impact on, um, like sometimes the compression over the um, tummy can affect things like um, uh, VP shunt function and um, wow. like gastrointestinal function and, yeah. yeah, things like that. You really um, do need to think yeah. about that, don't you? And I guess yeah. the other flip side yeah. of that as well is if there's not much research done in an intervention, you don't know what the adverse events are. There are some anecdotal reports because obviously there's anecdotal reports about DMI and CME, but there's also anecdotal reports about the adverse events, which is not reported in here, but we have heard about them in terms of femoral fractures, you know. Um, oh, yeah, that does exist. Arrest and, you know, things like that. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. So I guess, again, the value of making sure we're evidence-based. Absolutely. Know, following yeah. and, and studying it. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. that's that's what we know doesn't work and things that are below the worth it line currently for its evidence. Let's talk about things that are above the worth it line. Um, Should we talk about the ones that you feel are the go-tos for the clinicians that are out there? What's there? What should we be doing? What's above this line, Monica? What's above the line? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So um, some of the things that are above the line 
were say hypnotherapy is one. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's not heaps done in Australia, actually. Like there's things like um, writing for the disabled, which is um, probably not strictly hypnotherapy. Like that's more kind of adaptive force writing, you know, um, as an activity. It's not really strictly hypnotherapy. Yeah. Mm. So that's not a big one in Australia. Um, But yeah, that one's above the line. Um, Botox um, for the upper and lower limb is above the line. Um, Again, I just want to point out this is for um, outcomes related to um, plasticity and um, gait, uh, gait outcomes. Yes, um, of course. So, yeah, I know yes. Botox is not across um, everything. Is, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yes, no, and I know yeah. there's been a lot in um, you know in the last few years about what are some of the you know again what are some of the adverse effects of Botox. Mm. But um, yeah, but for those outcomes, there's mm-hmm. um, uh, yeah, good evidence for Brilliant. them. Um, and SDR and ITB as well. So um, reducing spasticity um, and uh, and helping with, um, yeah, movement and um, pain and dystonia. Yeah. Yeah, really interesting in terms of what is yeah. what is listed above that line. And, I mean, hypotherapy is something yeah. that we've – I remember being always really shocked. I'm like, oh, hypotherapy is there. But when you're thinking about actual postural control and what it does, uh, and children probably really enjoy it as well. <laughs> that's the other part of it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, yeah, and so the compliance with hypotherapy is often really good because um, mm. it's really fun. You know, you're just going to ride a horse. Yeah. Yes, and yes. the other thing about hypotherapy compared to things like whole body vibration, for example. Um, so like a horse is a lot more unpredictable. And so mm. you are actually learning to, um, and the way a horse moves, yes. um, you know, I mean, it's done in a really controlled environment. Yeah. You're not going to have bolting horses. It's not a wild but, rodeo. Um, yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> but, you know, like the way a horse moves, uh-huh. and, you know, stops uh-huh. and starts and things like that, like the way um, you need to learn to adjust as that's happening um, is quite different to something that's a much more kind of constant and less variable um, that's such a good point. Situation. Yeah, yeah, that's such a good yeah. point. So they're the ones we know yeah. about, but yeah. there's there's obviously these yeah. other sections. Um, there's two more. I oh, wait, forgot two about there's two there's, more. Um, hip surveillance. Yeah. Oh yes, hip yes. Hip surveillance yep. um, and scoliosis surgery as well. So mm. I mean, scoliosis surgery it makes sense, but if someone's got a you know um, a really significant scoliosis and mm-hmm. then you put metal rods in their spine um, to Straighten it up. Function. Yeah, that's quite yeah, effective. Yeah. That's good. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you know, and it's it's really interesting. Like we find a lot of kids after scoliosis surgery. Um, yeah, their function is a lot better because all of a sudden they've got metal rods holding them in place yeah. rather than their muscles trying to hold them in place. And yeah. you know, that can. Um, yeah, that can be. How reassuring sort of, reduces for the degrees of freedom to know that though, because I think it's such a big surgery, and you sort of um and ah about mm-hmm. it a fair bit, and go, oh, should we do it? But yeah. it's great yeah. to know that. You and can. often people going to it. Too late. Yeah, 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 that's right. That's a yeah. really good one for yeah. us to know about. Yeah. And yeah. now we move it to yeah. that big yellow section. <laughs> so it's above yeah. the work at line. So it's probably do it. They have some evidence and we probably yeah. can do it. And there's quite a lot in there. So mm. I'll get you to talk through yeah. what are the big things from that area. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I guess, um, yeah, there's a lot of things that people would, you know, would be some of the go-to. So things like AFOs, um, standing frames, hand splints, um, balance training. So that makes sense that if yes. you, you know, do some balance training, then you're controlled in frames. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, uh, and um, serial casting and Botox, uh, yeah. standing frames, different types of surgery. Um yeah for lower limbs and um, lower limbs, um, sleep positioning systems for people, um, but probably over two years old. We don't sure, recommend the use of, of them in children under two. Yeah. 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 Um, and then some different tone management drugs. Um, yeah. yeah. So they're sort of some of the things that are in that yellow probably do it yeah. area. And I guess when it's probably do it, it's just a matter of making sure we take, like with everything, outcome measures, evaluating the effect for that individual child. Yes. Like that's the yeah. that's the main thing, isn't it? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And I think really keeping in mind that end goal, like what, so, you know, there might be an issue with postural deformity or postural control, mm-hmm. um, but what what are we actually wanting to improve? Yes. Like yeah. what is that limiting? Yes. What, what are we actually wanting to improve at the end of the day? Yeah. Because it, like, yes, that might be one of the things that's limiting that, but is that the only thing that we can change mm. or is addressing that actually going to improve that outcome? Mm, mm, I like that. Yeah. And I, I often love... think of it like um, the old lady who swallowed the fly, you know, like the further, <laughs> the, like the further away from the swallowing the fly, you know, like um, if you have to swallow a cat to swallow the, to, you know, to swallow the bird, to <laughs> swallow the spider, to swallow the fly, like the yes. more steps there are, like... Yeah. <laughs> 
is that <laughs> really analogy, working? You know, like, and yes. part of why that story is so funny is because mm. it just gets more and more absurd. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like, but um, <laughs> sometimes this is what we're sort of expecting sometimes, you know, we're like four steps removed from what we're actually wanting to improve. Um, And is that actually making a difference? Yeah. Yeah. I think about, um, in my head, I think about Ginny Pallig and she often goes, you know, is this this magical thinking? (laughs) And, you know, let's let's just actually think really, um, really analytically about what it is that we want to try to achieve. And there's a lot of things here above the worth it line to look at and look at what the goals might be and the health and well-being of the child Mm -hmm. and their family family like on a yes and yeah. it comes back to what Martin Goff was saying back then as well wasn't yeah. it? look at the personal and environmental mm-hmm. factors let's look broadly yes. yeah um, at yeah. what matters yeah mm. and yes they might be a bit straighter but is this a you know is this had an impact on the family because it's now a lot more burden for the caregiver or they're now right. on, you know or they're now actually in a bit of pain because they're kind of really forcing them to a position that's not super comfortable for that's them or such um, a good point yeah. that's such a good point and yeah, yeah it's like an extra two degrees of extra active um, postural control worth the 50 hours that it took to yes. to go to yeah. sessions and the opportunity cost. Like yeah. it's, it's really evaluating yeah. all yeah. those things, isn't it? Yeah, mm. yeah. And, you know, I hear, you know, like, and yes, their trunk control might be better, but can they, can they sit? Like is, you yeah. know, can they, like, and, um, and there's really varying, you know, like for some children it might make the difference between like someone who's GNFCS4, you know, like so now they can sit independently on the, on the edge of the bed so their parent can get them dressed. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a really meaningful change. But um, if, you know, but if they can sit still on a really still flat surface for a couple of seconds, yeah. does that mean that yeah. anything in their life Yeah. They can function any better, you yeah. know, in in anything really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That leads me. Okay, well, that's a really good we, point. Can we we have a question to, <laughs> yeah. to kind of bring everything together because there's so yeah. much from this. Yeah. So if a child has hypertonia, so they have low postural tone yeah. and control, mm. how possible yeah. is it as therapists for us to increase their postural control? So say yeah, like, yes, yeah. four, four or five. Yep. You know, like if four you, five. yeah, you know, and you really you want they've got low postural c- control, they've got low tone. Mm. Yeah. What 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 would you be doing there? Like if a clinician sort of looking at this child in front of them, like should they be trying to improve their postural control? Should they be providing mm-hmm. support? How possible is it to improve their postural control given that neurological impact and all the connections? Mm-hmm. I don't know. What what would your thoughts yeah. be on that based on what you've found here? Yeah. So my, well, some of my thoughts, like bringing it back to kind of neuroscience um, or the neuroplasticity sort of theories, you know, like how long is it since the injury? So if you've got someone who's, 5, 10, 15 years old, mm-hmm. um, they've got a brain that's been working like this for 15, you know, for that mm-hmm. length of time. Mm-hmm. And how much can we change how how that works? Mm-hmm. Um, but also, on the other hand, you know, we've got that move it or lose it kind of, you know, use it mm-hmm. or lose it principle as well. So if you're not practicing, you're not going to get better at something that you don't practice. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that's kind of conflicting on that, um, on that part of, you know, on that side of things. Um, but also thinking about... Um, you know, like some of the children who have, um, who are GMFCS level four and five, like a lot more of the brain is affected. Like how much are we, like the brain structures and processes that have to happen in the brain, how much are we going to be able to change that? Yeah. Um, I don't know. Like, is it possible? I don't want to conclude, I don't want to 100% say like, no, we can't improve anything, mm. but I would be really, I would try and have really realistic, really conservative kind of, well, let's try it for a little while and see if we improve this or, you know, or do we need to try and improve this? Can we accommodate with something else? You know, like um, Mm. I think thinking about the alternatives that exist to trying to improve postural control. Yeah. Um, Yeah. I think, um, yeah, I mean, most of the evidence hasn't shown that it's, there's going to be a huge effect on postural control. Mm-hmm. Um, having said that, I mean, there's always limitations, you know, there's limitations to the studies. Um, it's really hard to measure some of these things. Um, but I would I would really try and think about what's going on in the background. How do I think this is going to work and how is that going to work on a background of a, a brain that has, you know, had a fairly significant injury? Sure. Um, yeah. And how else could I what else might be effective? Yeah. yeah. Like this is not your only option. Yeah. yeah, that's right. I guess it's putting all your eggs in one basket kind of thing. It's, yeah. yeah, I guess it's, we want function as well. I mm-hmm. remember talking to Carol Schrader not that long yeah. ago and she was saying, um, you know, I, I don't want my child to arrive at school every day tired mm-hmm. <laughs> because they're working so oh, hard right. to get there and they can't learn. So you do want to make sure yeah. that you are 
um, providing opportunities to do what they need to be able to do uh, and, and providing yeah. support, providing postural Absolutely. support mm-hmm. will allow them to Absolutely. do that. So they don't have to think about what yes. they're doing for sitting. They yeah. can actually sit with support yeah. and then they can concentrate yes. and learn as yeah. well. Yeah, because, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, thinking about what's automatic and what's not automatic about postural control, like when any of us do something that's more posturally challenging, that mm-hmm. uses up more of our brain power. And so if you're using all your brain power on trying to stay upright and, you know, yes. like you haven't got much free for other things. Yes, um, yes. And especially when other things may already be more challenging, like with communication, you know, if, um, yeah. like the mechanics coordinating your muscles to move yes. or, yes. you know, yeah. for speaking is yes. um, already tricky and then you're trying to, you know. Yep, laid onto that know, a like, pretty significant brain yes. injury uh, with yeah. all the effects yeah. Yeah, that might yes. happen there. Yeah. Capacity. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, and also postural control, you know, like static postural control in sitting is one thing, but then sitting, we don't sit to do, well, very rarely do we sit to just sit, you know, like we <laughs> sit and do things. Yeah. And um, so like it might be fine sitting, but uh, can you sit and reach or sit and, you know, bring mm. food to your mouth to eat mm. or sit and do things yeah. yeah and so I think that's what I think is missing sometimes when you're just practicing those really static postural control things yeah. um yeah yeah that's right does that's it make right. a difference to someone's function yeah yeah yep. always thinking the bigger picture look we um mm. have so many more questions for you but we have significantly mm. run out of time so we clearly do need to keep talking about more things within this review I really encourage everyone to have a look at this article we'll put a link for it in our website so you can actually have a look at um, everything that's been included in there because we certainly haven't been uh, able to complete all of it but we <laughs> we've had at least some discussions mm. around it uh, so we do need to now and just- could I add a plug too I would oh, yeah, encourage people it. to um, yeah. go back to the papers that we reference as well because yes. I think obviously in a yes. review like this um, we can only include a really small amount of information that has come from a paper of that course. already has a lot of information yeah, that's so right. I'd really encourage people to you know if you've got interventions that you're particularly interested in um, to go back to those too. Such yeah. a good idea because it's like what 2,000 participants or how many was it? Was it 22,000? 20, yeah, 22,000. Yeah, 20, yeah. yeah. So yeah, yeah you can't yeah. put that all in yeah. one uh, word limited systematic mm. review. <laughs> um, so yeah. look, before we finish up though we should wrap it all up bring it all together in our favourite segment, which is what everyone says, tell it to Ed. Ed, as you know, is our producer. He doesn't have a background in child health, but he has been listening on this episode, I'm sure, taking notes, pressing buttons and faders and things like that. So before Ed launches into his question, Monica, I'll get you to summarise what we've spoken about today, which is a fair bit of stuff, in about 60 seconds or so, and Ed can ask you a question. So take it away, Monica. Okay. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm going. Um, so, Ed, with, um, as part of a really large team, we reviewed evidence from systematic review, um, from s- systematic reviews of interventions aimed to improve the ability of people with CP to maintain their postural control or balance, um, or for people who had higher levels of movement limitation, looking at interventions that affected their posture and preventing and prevention of musculoskeletal deformities over time. And the evidence on the whole was of low quality, so it's hard to draw really strong conclusions or make strong recommendations. But there are some interventions that we think aren't worth it, and that's interventions that are more passive, um, and uh, where the person um, isn't as involved in working on them in moving themselves. Um, And based on the evidence, there were others that might be effective and that's a lot of the interventions that we use. And so we would really encourage people to um, measure those interventions and the outcomes and think about um, all the things that are happening and the other effects that are happening. Um, And then there's another group of interventions that in most cases we think are really effective. Um, And we encourage clinicians to keep in mind the unintended effects of intervention and watch out for these as well. That was a beautiful yeah, summary. Well that wow. was great. That was great. Very good for yeah, a 60-second exactly. wrap-up. Exactly. Well mm-hmm. done, Monica. All right. <laughs> <laughs> now it's Ed's turn. <laughs> Take oh, it God. away, Ed. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, I, I've really loved today's conversation and, and I think one of the things that kind of grabbed me was the the, the conversation piece about opportunity cost and I guess um, uh, real-life um, functionality, quality of life differences and you know, you've, you've obviously talked about interventions that, that are you know, worth it or deemed to be worth it and those that, that possibly aren't. And I guess my question is probably going to be a little bit devil's advocate, I guess, maybe. Um, and I know that sitting through nearly 200 episodes and we're getting really close to that, that mark now and I've kind of heard a lot of things about... I was hoping I'd get a prize for 200. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so I've, I've heard a lot about the whole research world and, and a lot of it's, it's, it's 
very fascinating. And I guess there's that whole 17-year gap between the implementation of research and into clinical practice and that concept that, you know, that the absence of evidence might not be the evidence of an absence of effectiveness. And I guess there's, there's these interventions that are below the worth it line, they seem to run on anecdotal evidence because obviously there's lots of before, lots of after videos and people seem very convinced by it. And I guess my question is, is how, how do we account for those results scientifically and, and is maturation or kids just growing up part of what we're seeing there? Mm. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, I think it's always really tricky to tease out what what's as a result of intervention, also what um, how long those effects are. Like, mm. so for some of the invention, interventions, like we said, stretching um, is you know not really probably not really something that's effective. Um, but uh, when you when you look at some of the studies, they're like the really short term effect of stretching. Like when you um, stretch a muscle and then you know. 10, 30 seconds later, you measure how much a joint can move, um, it's better. But then when you go back 10 minutes later, 30 minutes later, you know, two days later, um, <laughs> it's not effective. And so I wonder um, if that's what's coming into some of these, that, you know, like there's that okay. immediate effect of like, oh, I've just been practising this and, you know, yes, I am a little bit better at this. Wow. Um, yeah. I wonder if that's sort of, if there's a little bit of that that's happening as well. Um, but I also... Um, wonder with some of those interventions, like in a very specific context and, you know, when you're practising a very specific movement or activity, um, yes, that they might get better at that. Mm -hmm. But then, ha I don't know, I always come back to this, well, then so what? Like how is their life, what's going to be easier to do in their life or what can they do better now because mm. they can do that? Mm. Um, Such an yeah. interesting, thought-provoking answer. I love that. That is so good. The stretching one's an interesting yeah. one because I often try to stretch and then I feel really good and then you look at my range, you know, half an hour later, I'm like, oh, it's gone. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah, next right. day I'm like, oh, it's gone. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. That's what the evidence says. It's yeah. true. Yeah. yeah. Really interesting yeah. perspective. I guess one really quick follow-up to that though is yeah. obviously yeah. I've, <laughs> <laughs> I've talked about, about the research being, well, kind of behind clinical practice, well, clinical practice mm. being behind research and, and, and that the evidence that kind of gets generated. Mm. Um, like are, are, are some people just simply ahead of the game? Like is, is there something where the scientific community is kind of pointing in a direction and and these guys are obviously pointing in a different direction and is mm. are they 17 years ahead is basically what I'm asking. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um Look, it's hard to I think it's hard to answer. Um, I would say some of like some of these interventions are based on interventions that are older and have you know mm. um, we kind of do know that they're not effective or you know in all mm. the time that that intervention has existed there hasn't been any research done in CP um, yeah. and so is it reasonable to assume that this new version of that old intervention is going to work? Um, and also I think alongside of that like you know like yes you know, there's some of these sort of newer interventions, but thinking always about what's the mechanism of action and what do we know, like what are the, in, always coming back to those ingredients of like, well, what do we know does improve function yeah, and okay. does that intervention fit in with those principles? Mm. And so I always come back to, you know, I always say to parents, you need to really think about whose brain is working. Uh, you know, I mean, this is a classic Iona Novak thing, you know, <laughs> whose brain is, is working. Yeah. Like is your, like is your child's brain telling their body to move or is someone else telling your child body you know telling your child's body how to move mm. um mm. amazing yeah great lots of things to think about good questions ed thank yeah. you yeah. yeah i hope that answers the question yeah, yeah. No, i think it, there's lots to think about from there monica it was so wonderful to speak with you like we've spoken for nearly an hour and i feel like i could talk to you for so much longer still like just absolutely brilliant thank you for joining us on the show today <laughs> 
Thanks for having me. Oh, we yeah, loved it. Thank you so much. I'm excited um, mm. to see what you move on to in the future. But yeah. we could keep talking about this, but yeah. I know... We'll talk about that offline. Yeah, after. Yeah, let's talk about but that yes. <laughs> for sure. Uh, for all of our listeners, you know, really encourage you to have a look at this article, like I said. Uh, head to our website, researchworks.net. We'll put a link for that there so you can find it. And, of course, there's a CPD form there that you can fill out as well to keep this as part of your record of your PD requirements. Um, so, yeah, stay tuned and we'll have so much more to come as we head towards our 200th episode. My goodness. It's amazing. Isn't it amazing? Mm. Amazing. Great and Monica, thank course. you again. Correct. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and thank <laughs> you again, Monica, and to all of our listeners. We'll talk to you all again really soon. Bye. Bye. Yeah.